The Edward Byrne Jones exhibition at the Tate Britain is vast. The 150 objects on display illustrate his skill not only as a painter, but as a draftsman, a colorist, and a designer. Born under the much plainer name of Ted Jones in 1833, he abandoned a degree at Oxford to join the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a group of artists who included William Holman Hunt, John Everett Millet, and Byrne Jones's idol, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And like them, he was obsessed with the past. Edward Byrne Jones was really fascinated by medieval literature and history and legends and tales. Tales from the past, myths, legends, and this kind of imagined world that he would create to bring these to life for his audience and his art-loving public. Those tales include the adoration of the Magi, which reimagines the three kings visiting Jesus in the nativity scene, and Laos Veneras, which depicts Venus pining for the knight who left her. Perhaps the star of the show is this room. Ben James' reimagining of the myth of Perseus is set across ten glorious paintings. It is, quite simply, epic. The Perseus paintings feature an array of mythical characters, from Medusa to Atlas and the Three Nymphs. Sleeping Beauty was another fairy tale Byrne Jones turned into a sequence. The wonderful Briar Rose series, Sleeping Beauty, not a narrative series in the sense of the Perseus series, not showing a continuation or a story from one element to a beginning and an end. We have halfway through, um, a single moment captured in time with the prince arriving at the scene and the princess herself, the sleeping beauty, awaiting the kiss, awaiting to be woken from this slumber. But it isn't all just paintings. Stained glass window commissions were Burne Jones's bread and butter. He had a keen sense of humour. In these cartoons, he's made his friend, the designer William Morris, much larger than he was. He created tapestries and even decorated this piano as a birthday gift for the daughter of his patron. As his career develops, his artistic output de develops, and we have him kind of as this kind of transitional figure from what we call pre-Raphaelite pre art into symbolism, aesthetic art towards the end of the 19th century, where narrative isn't quite so important and it's more to do with idea and form. Um, colour, structure. So he's an artist that's really radical, inventing new ideas, inventing new compositions, and transforming art in the late 19th century into something quite new and something that would then transform into modernism in the 20th century. Edward Byrne Jones at the Tate will remain on display until February 2019. It offers a glimpse into a world of myths and legends, magic and fairy tales. It's the best of Byrne Jones's imagination and the final swan song of the Pre-Raphaelites. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Let's go to London now and speak with art journalist Joe Lawson Tancred to get a greater perspective on Byrne Jones. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, now, Tell me about how the pre-Raphaelite uh, Brotherhood had an effect on his artistry. Well, in many ways, Byrne Jones became an artist because of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. He was actually studying theology at Oxford, and he kind of became inspired by their works, in particular Rossetti. When he left Oxford and he didn't finish his degree, he studied a bit with Rossetti, and that's the closest he ever got to a formal art training. He was largely self-taught. So in that way, Rossetti gave him the confidence to even become an artist. And even stylistically, um, Byrne Jones is a member of the second generation of pre-Raphaelites. And that was very much led by Rossetti, who had been an original member. When he met Byrne Jones, his art was kind of becoming increasingly decorative. It was imagining new worlds, and it was less interested in um, the naturalism that had marked earlier years of pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely the same path that Byrne Jones went on. That's how he fits in. Wow. Now, his painting was actually the most expensive painting to be sold uh, among the um, pre-Raphaelite uh, crew. But he was also an outsider at the same time. Tell me why that was like that. 
Well, again, I mean, certainly he was different from his artistic peers, definitely in the sense that he wasn't trained in a formal way. But even more so, I mean, even as he became successful in the 1870s, he was um, exhibited every year at the Grosvenor Gallery, and that was really the place to be seen. And he was incredibly successful there. Critics loved him. But even still, he was always kind of wary of the art establishment. As he became a celebrity, he also withdrew. He had a, 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 a studio in Fulham, and that's really where he spent most of his time. He only saw close friends. So, you know, he was always kind of inside, but also outside. Now, female characters was actually one of his favorite subjects uh, to create artworks from. Why did he, why was he so obsessed uh, with females? Well, I think um, the females, the way that they're so Bon Jonesian, they're very beautiful and, and their facial structures are very similar, they're very striking. And so we, we see them and we can see it's Burne Jones. But I think for him, they also add some depth to his narratives. I mean, when we look at them, it's easy to underestimate them. They're quite languid, they're quite listless. But actually, if we look beneath and we look at their expressions, there's often something quite sinister. A lot of his female protagonists are threatening and, and some of them are aggressive towards men in ways that Victorian audiences sometimes found perverse. So he definitely had very interesting female protagonists that have a lot of depth to them and he kind of builds femininity in a very dimensional way. Now Joe, um, Byrne Jones has been praised for a lot of his artwork but at the same time he's been criticized as well. Uh, why was he criticized so much and what was he criticized for? Well I think um, he's always been criticized I think um, because his vision is so specific, I think it's something you either kind of like or you don't. And, and that remains today. I think you kind of either want to go into his world with him or you really don't. And I think, well, on the one hand, his works can be seen as quite inventive reinterpretations of known literary sources. Other people find them too melancholic, too artificial, too out of touch, too inward looking and often sometimes too boring. But from my perspective, I think that's something quite exciting about his work. There aren't that many art historical figures that we still debate about. So it's good to have a kind of discussion and for people to not entirely know what they make of him. Mm -hmm. He is indeed very unique. Joe, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase mm -hmm. today and sharing that insight with us. It's my pleasure.